25. Typology and us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 to 13. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. This is one of those great passages which opens up a vast realm of Scripture, and many, many books could be and have been written without exhausting its meaning about the implications of this text. In verse 6, Paul speaks, as also in verse 11, of in samples or examples, a word better understood by us as types. Types and typology are less in view in our time than in the past. Typology presupposes a pattern in history ordained by God whereby past biblical events have a correspondence to later events and also to history since then. The events of the Old Testament are made clear in their meaning in the New Testament and together they explain the purposes of God in all of history. Typology assumes that the God of Scripture is continuously active in working out his purposes so that we can better understand our history by knowing full well the biblical history. God says, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. And this is why typology is relevant to us. Because of typology, the Bible always has a present relevance. It guides and it constrains us, not only by its laws and instructions, but by its history and its meaning. For this reason, Paul begins this part of the text with the words, Now these things were our ensamples, or types, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Verse 6. Quote-unquote they refers to the Hebrews of the Exodus generation. Delivered from Egyptian slavery, they whined and complained because they lacked the security of slavery and had to walk by faith. In verses 7 and 8, Paul refers to the episode of Exodus chapter 32, Israel's fertility cult celebration while Moses was on Mount Sinai. His language, however, is inclusive also of the time of whoredom with the woman of Moab in Numbers chapter 25. In both instances, with only a slight provocation, Israel lapsed into a ready apostasy of a flagrant sort. Because of their sin, some 23,000 died in a single day, according to Numbers chapter 25, verse 9. The number who died in the plague were 24,000. The figures are approximate, and Paul chooses to underestimate the number in order to stress the offence. The offence of Israel was to, quote, tempt Christ, end quote, to try the patience of the coming Messiah, of God the King. For people who were miraculously delivered and cared for to try the patience of the great King was the height of folly, and many died, struck by serpents. Numbers chapter 21, verse 6. They had chosen to despise God's manna. Numbers chapter 21, verse 5. And they paid the price for it. They wanted the privilege of freedom, but not its responsibilities. They wanted the blessings of God, but when God put them to the test, they whined and complained and reproached God. 
Their complaining was a direct affront to Christ the King. All complaining is seen by Christ the Lord as a challenge to his wisdom and purpose. Paul clearly has the Corinthians in mind, and us. This comes out in verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. We read of Israel's complaining in Numbers chapter 14, verse 2 and verse 36, and chapter 16, verse 11, and verse 14, and other texts. The destroyer is death, eternal death. Paul makes clear that we never have a right to complain against God. His purposes for us are to test us and to prepare us for eternity, and he best knows what we need. As Isaac Watts said, must we go to heaven on flowery beds of ease? In verse 11, Paul tells us, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples or types, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. This is a remarkable statement, one of the most far-reaching in its implications in the whole of Paul's letter. Paul says the Old Testament history was recorded for the Christian community to admonish and to teach it. The Old Testament is the church's book. It was written and given to teach Christians what God requires of them. This is the meaning of its typology. The meaning and culmination of history rests with the Christian community upon whom the ends of the world are come. This tells us that the Old Testament is even more relevant for the Christian community than it was for Israel, because it is in the Christian realm that the meaning of God's plan and history unfolds. This means, therefore, as great as the judgment was upon Israel, even greater judgment from God will be upon the church for refusing to heed his warnings. For the church to see the Old Testament as primarily a Jewish book is fearfully wrong. Besides being God's law book for all time, and in addition to declaring that the atonement is by vicarious substitutionary sacrifice, Old Testament history gives us God's teaching for Christians in his dealing with waywardness and sin. The church, too, has a long wilderness journey, and God is less tolerant of the apostasy of your people, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Verse 11 God, who judged Israel severely, will be even more severe in his judgment on the church. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Verse 12 The self-righteousness of Israel in the wilderness is exceeded by the Corinthian church and by countless churchmen since then. Lest anyone assume that God's testing of men in history is too severe and essentially unfair, Paul adds in verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God's trials of us are not excessive, whatever we may think. In verse 7, Paul refers to the drunken behaviour and sexuality of sinning Israel as, quote, play, end quote, an interesting term. Now, sin in the Bible is trying to be our own God, determining for ourselves what is good and evil. The essence of our creaturehood is responsibility to God our Maker. When man plays God, its appeal for him is the supposed freedom from responsibility. That is why sin is so appealing. Over the years, I have seen all too many men and women commit adulteries with persons far inferior in every way to their own spouse. But virtue means responsibility, whereas the appeal of sin is irresponsibility, using other people for one's own purposes. This is why, when adulterous couples divorce and marry one another, their pleasure is often gone, because irresponsibility is replaced with responsibility. Responsibility is basic to creaturehood, and it is death to try to escape it. Paul, in verse 13, presents faithfulness and virtue as the easier way, because God so ordains it. We are able to bear trials because God so wills it. 
If we refuse the trials, we refuse God's way for us. For Paul, faith is essentially related to the God-created patterns or to typology because faith sees a purpose and direction in all of history, past and present. The focus of that meaning and pattern is the kingdom of God, not the Corinthians, nor us. The purposes of history unfold in time and in us, but they transcend us. Israel erred in seeing itself as the end, and the church is too commonly guilty of the same error. There is a blessedness in knowing our place, our limitations, our future in Christ, and our privilege and duty in everything to give thanks. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6.